Chapter Eight of A Voyage to the South Sea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter Eight. Expedition to Taitaba after a heifer. Extraordinary domestic arrangements. Tina's mother visits the ship. A sheep brought from Uleatea. Heavy storm. Death of the surgeon. Taona and Toaroa harbors examined. 1788, November. After dinner I went on shore, and, while I was at the tents, from having exposed myself too much in the sun, I was taken ill and continued in much pain for near an hour. This was soon known among the natives, and I was exceedingly surprised to see Tina and all the principal people, both men and women, collecting round me, and offering their assistance. For this short illness I was made ample amends by the pleasure I received from the attention and appearance of affection in these kind people. Friday, 14. This morning I had numberless inquiries after my health. The weather being fine, I invited Tina, Oreepaya, and Pueno to accompany me to Tetaha in order to inquire after the cow and soon after sunrise we set off in the launch. Taitaha is nearly four leagues from Point Venus. On our arrival, Tina sent a man to give notice of our visit. The chief of the district, whose name was Tepaho'o, did not appear, but sent a messenger to demand if I only came to see the cow or to take it away with me. In answer to this, I sent assurances that I only desired to see it, and the chiefs who were with me spoke to the same effect. I was then desired to proceed in the boat farther along shore to the westward. In our way, Tina made me stop among some fishing canoes to purchase fish for him, which he ate raw with salt water for sauce. When we arrived at the landing place, a great number of people had collected, and soon after Te Paho'o arrived. Oreepaya and I went with him about a quarter of a mile, where I was shown one of the most beautiful heifers I ever saw. I asked if they had any more, but they all said there was no other than a bull at Itea, as before mentioned. I could not refrain from expressing my displeasure at the destruction and the foolish separation of these fine animals. I had shared with Captain Cook in the trouble of this business, and had been equally anxious for the success. The district of Tetaha is not so luxuriant and fruitful as the country about Mataavi. As I saw nothing of consequence to detain me, I made a present to Tepaho'o, and after inviting him to visit me on board the ship, which he promised to do, I took leave. Tina had remained all this time in the boat. I observed that no respect was shown to him at this place, nor was he able to procure a coconut or a breadfruit otherwise than by purchasing it. The heifer being here is a proof of this district not having been friendly to the people of Mataavi and Opare. On our way back, having to row against the wind, we stopped to refresh at Opare, and it was eight o'clock by the time we arrived at the ship. I kept my fellow travellers on board to supper, and they did not fail to remind me of the king's health. Monday, 17. Our collection of breadfruit plants at the tents continued increasing. This morning I sent twelve on board, in pots, to discover where they would thrive the best, the air being more temperate on board the ship than on shore. While I was absent from the ship, Te Paho'o had been on board and left a hog as a present for me. After dinner today, Tina, who was my constant visitor, left the table sooner than usual. When he was gone, Oreepaya, his brother, and Oadd told me a piece of scandal, which had been before hinted to me, but which till now I had not heard of with certainty. This was that Idea, Tina's wife, kept a gallant, who was a toto, or servant, and the very person who always fed Tina at dinner. And this was so far from being without Tina's knowledge or consent that they said it was by his desire. They added many other circumstances, and, as I appeared to doubt, they took several opportunities in the course of the day of mentioning it to other people, who all declared it was true. Tuesday, 18. 
This afternoon I saw Teipahoo and invited him on board. Before we parted, I bargained with him for the heifer which he promised to bring in five days. My intention was that if I got the heifer, I could endeavor to purchase the bull at Itehea, but if that could not be done, then I could send the heifer as a present to the possessor of the bull, which might equally well answer my purpose. It has been mentioned that Tina had a place in my cabin to keep those things which I gave him as being more secure on board than on shore. I had remarked lately that his hoard seemed to diminish the more I endeavored to increase it. At length I discovered that Idea kept another hoard in the master's cabin, which she regularly enriched from her husband's whenever I gave him a present, apprehending that I should cease giving when I saw Tina's locker full. At his request I set the carpenters to work to make him a chest large enough for himself and wife to sleep on. Captain Cook had formerly given him such a chest, but it had been taken from him by the Aimea people. Friday, 21. This forenoon I received a message from Tepaho'o to acquaint me the heifer was brought to Mataavi. I immediately went on shore and found that he had been as good as his word. The purchase money was paid, which consisted of a shirt, a hatchet, a spike nail, a knife, a pair of scissors, a gimlet, and file, to which was added a small quantity of loaf sugar. Tepaho'o appeared well pleased with his bargain, and I sent the heifer to Poeeno's residence, near which was plenty of grass. In the afternoon I was invited to a heiva, the most extraordinary part of which was an oration, with some ceremonies and compliment to us. Twelve men were divided into four ranks, with two women in the front. Behind them all stood a priest who made a speech which lasted ten minutes, and which was listened to with some attention. During this the picture of Captain Cook, which had been brought for that purpose, was placed by my side. When the priest left off speaking, a piece of white cloth was wrapped round the picture, and another piece round me. The priest then spoke again for a short time, and an old man placed a piece of plated coconut leaf at my feet. The same was done to Tina, and one piece was put under the picture. After this the dancing began, which was in the same style that we had already seen. The head of the ship was the figure of a woman, and not ill-carved. As we were painting the ship's upper works, I directed this figure to be painted in colors, with which the islanders were much pleased. Not only the men, but the women desired me to bring English women when I came again. Today Oedadi, thinking that I was not convinced of the truth of what he had told me about Idea, mentioned the affair to the lady herself in my hearing, at which she laughed, but said he did ill to tell me of it. However, it was evident she was not much offended, for they were both very much diverted in discoursing upon the subject. I find it is not at all uncommon for brothers to have connections with the wives of each other, particularly elder brothers with the wives of their younger brothers, which is generally allowed and no offense taken. But if any person not belonging to the family endeavors at the same intimacy, it is resented as an injury. Inclination seems to be the only binding law of marriage at Otaheite. As I proposed to get instruments on shore at Point Venus to make observations, I desired Tina to order a house to be brought there for me, which was done and fixed in half an hour, being only a light shed supported by posts. Monday, 24. Today I bought a turtle that was caught on the reefs. As Tina was going to leave me for a few days, I had it dressed for his dinner. He told me that his mother, Ube Reee Roa, was arrived from the island Tethu Roa, and begged that I would send for her in the morning, and take care of her till he returned, which I willingly promised. Tuesday, 25. This morning I sent a boat to Opare, which returned in the afternoon with Ube Reee Roa and two women, her servants. As she was old and corpulent, it was with difficulty that we helped her up the ship's side. As soon as she was in the ship, she sat down on the gangway, and, clasping my knees in her arms, expressed her pleasure at seeing me by a flood of tears. 
Her servants then produced three pieces of cloth, which, with a large hog, some breadfruit, plantains, and coconuts, she had brought as a present. As she was fatigued by her journey, she wished to remain on board all night, and I directed accommodations to be prepared, which was done with little trouble, as nothing more was necessary than a mat and some cloth spread on the deck. She had with her a favorite cat, bred from one that had been given her by Captain Cook. She told me all the misfortunes that had befallen her son and friends since Captain Cook left Otaheite. All the accounts agree in some of the cattle being now alive at the island A.E. Mayo. In number they differ, but that there were eight is the least account. Wednesday, 26. In the morning, Ube Re A. A. Roa, being desirous to go on shore, I made her a present of several things, which she did not care to take with her then, but requested I would keep them safe for her. Only Moana uh, and Po A. A. No dined with me today. They told me that Tina and his brother Oreepea were not on good terms together, and it was imagined they would fight as soon as the ship was gone. I had observed a coolness between them, and had at times endeavored to make them more cordial, but with very little effect. Their quarrel has arisen from a disagreement between their wives. In the afternoon a canoe from Uietea arrived in which was an Eare'e, or chief of that island, who is a nephew to Ube Re e Roa. He brought a sheep with him. The poor animal was infected with the mange and in very poor condition. The climate had not, as far as I could judge, altered the quality of the wool, with which he was well covered except a part about the shoulders. I imagined this animal to be the English ewe left by Captain Cook. The owner assured me that they were ten sheep at Huahayene, the truth of which I much doubted. I was surprised, and rather mortified, to find that he set so little value on this as to let me have it at the first word for a small adze. I sent it to be kept at Poeeno's with the heifer. Friday, 28. Tina and his wife returned to Mataavi, and from appearances which I have no reason to misdoubt, were sincerely glad to see me again after their short absence. They brought, as usual, a present of a hog and fruit. This morning there was an eclipse of the sun, but the weather was so cloudy that I had only an opportunity of observing the end of the eclipse, which was at 19 hours, 43 minutes, 53 seconds. Saturday, 29. I sent a man to shear the ewe, by which a remedy could be more easily applied to cure the disease with which it was infected. The garden made near the tents was not in a prosperous condition. Most of the melons and cucumbers were destroyed by insects, and the soil being sandy was not favorable to the other seeds. I therefore chose another spot of ground farther from the seaside, and had an assortment of seeds sown. December. Monday, 1. In the night, the rudder of one of the boats was stolen from the tents. On landing in the morning, neither Tina nor any of his family came near me, being, I was informed, afraid of my displeasure. As the loss was not great, I immediately sent to assure them that I had no anger except against the person who committed the theft. In consequence of this message, Tina and some of the other chiefs came to the tents and promised that they would exert themselves to discover the thief and get the rudder restored. This was the first theft of any consequence that had been committed since the tents were on the shore, and my suspicions fell chiefly on the people who were here from some of the other islands. Tina had just begun to build a house for himself, and I promised that our carpenter should assist him. Why de Ea, the youngest brother of Tina, had lately been one of my constant visitors, and seems to have left off his former custom of getting drunk with the Ava. He was esteemed one of their best warriors, and I was told that in the quarrel with the people of Eimeo, he killed Maheini, the chief of that island. Friday, 5. The weather for some time past had been very unsettled. 
This afternoon the wind blew fresh from the northwest, which occasioned the sea to break very high across the dolphin bank, and in the night such a heavy broken sea came into the bay that we were obliged to batten all the hatchways down, and to keep everybody on deck all night, though the rain came down in torrents. The ship rolled in a most violent manner. Saturday, 6. In the morning the wind increasing, and, there being no possibility of putting to sea, we struck yards and top masts and trusted to our anchors. The river swelled so much with the rain that the point of the land on which the tent stood became an island, and to preserve the breadfruit plants from being endangered, the people were obliged to cut a passage for the river through a part of the beach at a distance from the tent. The sea broke very high on the beach. Nevertheless, a canoe put off, and to my surprise, Tina, his wife, and Moana made their way good through the surf and came on board to see me. There was no other person in the canoe, for the weather did not admit of useless passengers. Each of them had a paddle which they managed with great activity and skill. These kind people embraced me with many tears and expressed their apprehensions for the safety of the ship. Towards noon, however, the sea abated considerably, but the wind continued to blow strong from the northwest. At sunset, Idea went on shore, but Tina would remain with me the whole night. Sunday, 7. The wind continued between the north and northwest, but had so much moderated that I no longer considered our situation to be alarming. At noon, Idea returned to the ship with a large hog and a supply of breadfruit and coconuts, and soon after she and Tina left the ship, having extracted a promise from me that if the weather was moderate, I would go on shore in the morning and visit their parents and sister, who, they told me, had been much alarmed on our account. I received a visit likewise from Poeeno and his wife. This woman had always shown great regard for us, and now, in our meeting, before I could be aware of it, she began beating her head violently with a shark's tooth, so that her face was covered with blood in an instant. I put a stop to this as soon as I could, and with the drying up of the blood her agitation subsided. This ceremony is frequently performed upon occasions either of joy or grief. Her husband said that if any accident happened to the ship, I should live with him, and that they would cut down trees and build me another ship. From this sample of the weather, and the information of the natives, I was convinced it would not be safe to continue in Mataevi Bay much longer, and I determined to get everything ready for sailing as speedily as I could. Monday, 8. The night proved moderate, and in the morning I went on shore, where I was received by Ube Re'e Roa, and several other friends with great affection. The plants received no injury from the bad weather, having been carefully covered from the spray of the sea. Some were in a dormant state, and others were striking out young shoots. Nelson thought it was better to refrain a few days from taking them on board. I therefore consented to defer it. He was of the opinion that the plants could be propagated from the roots only, and I directed some boxes to be filled as we could stow them where no others could be placed. Tuesday, 9. This afternoon, in hauling the launch on shore to be repaired, many of the natives assisting, one of them, a fine boy about ten years old, was thrown down and a roller which was placed under the boat went over him. The surgeon being ill, I sent off for his assistant. Fortunately, no limb was broken, nor did he receive any material injury. The surgeon had been a long time ill, the effect of intemperance and indolence. He had latterly scarce ever stirred out of his cabin, but was not apprehended to be in a dangerous state. Nevertheless, this evening he appeared to be so much worse than usual, that it was thought necessary to remove him to some place where he could have more air, but to no effect, for he died in an hour afterwards. This unfortunate man drank very hard, and was so averse to exercise, that he never would be prevailed on to take half a dozen turns upon deck at a time in the course of the voyage. Wednesday, 10. As I wished to bury the surgeon on shore, I mentioned it to Tina, who said there would be no objection, 
but that it would be necessary to ask his father's consent first, which he undertook to do, and immediately left me for that purpose. By this circumstance it appears that, although the eldest son of an Eare succeeds to the title and honours of the father as soon as he is born, yet a considerable portion of authority remains with the father even after the son is of age. When Tina returned I went with him to the spot intended for the burial place, taking with us two men to dig the grave, but on our arrival I found the natives had already begun it. Tina asked me if they were doing it right. There, says he, the sun rises, and there it sets. The idea that the grave should be east and west I imagine they learnt from the Spaniards, as the captain of one of their ships was buried at Otaheite in 1774. Certain it is they had not the information from anybody belonging to our ship, for I believe we should not have thought of it. The grave, however, was marked out very exactly. At four in the afternoon the body was interned, the chiefs and many of the natives came to see the ceremony, and showed great attention during the service. Some of the chiefs were very inquisitive about what was to be done with the surgeon's cabin on account of apparitions. They said when a person died in Otaheite, and was carried to the Tupapau, that as soon as night came he was surrounded by spirits, and if any person went there by himself they would devour him. Therefore they said that not less than two people together should go into the surgeon's cabin for some time. I did not endeavor to dissuade them from this belief, otherwise than by laughing and letting them know that we had no such apprehensions. In the afternoon the effects of the deceased were disposed of, and I appointed Mr. Thomas Denman Ledward, the surgeon's mate, to do duty as surgeon. Friday, 12. I went in a boat to examine the harbors around Opare, and found two formed by the reefs. The westernmost is the most convenient for sailing in or out, but it is not well sheltered from a northwest wind or sea. This harbor is called by the natives Taone. It is about a league and a half distant from Point Venus, and may be known by a remarkable mountain called by the natives Walre, which bears south southeast from the entrance. The easternmost harbor is called Toaroa. It is small, but as secure as a reef harbor can well be. It is about three miles distant from Point Venus. The chief objection to this harbor is the difficulty of getting out with the common trade wind, the entrance being on the east side, not more than 100 yards wide, and the depth without convenient for warping. On the south side of the entrance is a morae. The reef side is to be kept on board and a lookout to be kept from aloft, whence the shoal water is better discerned than from the deck. Sunday, 14. This forenoon we performed divine service. Many of the principal natives attended and behaved with great decency. Some of the women at one time betrayed an inclination to laugh at our general responses, but on my looking at them they appeared much ashamed. After the service I was asked if no offering was to be made for the Eatua to eat. The weather had been fair all the last week, and at this time appeared quite settled, so that I was under no apprehensions from danger for continuing a little longer in Mataavi Bay. End of chapter 8